In episode one, we went over four different cameras and put your preliminary photo analysis to the test by matching several photos to their respective camera bodies. We also talked about the camera I would recommend, which was the Canon 80D, but more importantly, we discussed why lenses are a more important investment. Today, we're gonna go over everything else from lighting to backdrops to even little nuances that you'll find very helpful in product photography. Welcome to episode two, lighting and studio gear. Hi, and welcome back to episode two. Out of everything that we talk about, the most important thing that we're gonna talk about is lighting. I would highly recommend you invest in a solid light. You can do product photography with natural lighting, but unless you're extremely fast and extremely lucky, your photos are going to turn out to be all over the place. The time of day, the amount of clouds, the type of windows that you have, there are too many factors that affect the type of natural light that you get. So the one light I would recommend to start out with is this $40 one. I've even used this light for a good amount of paid client work as well when I started off. The idea is to find a light that has a big surface area and that's also white and that's also going to diffuse softly. Now these lights typically do come with a diffuser but you can always throw on like a bed sheet or a roll of white paper over a light if you don't have one. The main light is called your key light. So I like to put this light in two different areas. The first area is to the right of the board game and actually right behind it. So technically it serves as a backlight. Now the next spot is on the same right side, but in the middle of the box. Now don't worry, we'll look at other components of the box as we move on in the series. Let's just keep it simple for now and focus just on the box. The light I use now is a professional grade option and it's one of the more recent things that I upgraded. But if I were to reset my photography and videography journey, then this one would be one of the very first things that I would have upgraded. This light is the Aperture 120D. It's mounted on this heavy duty C-stand, which comes separately. A C-stand is basically a metal pole that allows you to move the light in any direction that you want. C-stands in general, I would say are very important as well because they allow you to change your light source in practically any way you like. So you can get lots of different lighting setups from dramatic to studio and to also backlight. Now just to name a few particular lighting setups that I use. And all that can be done without having to move the light stand base at all. The Aperture 120D is a crazy good light because it can go from ridiculously bright to ridiculously dim. You can control the lighting output by percentage. It also has other features too that aren't relevant to product photography as well, but definitely useful in other contexts. The third piece of this entire setup is actually the light dome itself. There's a small option and a big option. I went with the small option strictly due to studio size, but I would go with the big one if I had the chance. Bottom line, this light is amazing. I would only get it if you plan to pursue product photography professionally because it is quite a big investment. But if you are thinking about upgrading different pieces of gear, light should definitely be one of the first things to upgrade because it is a game changer. So those two are both main lights, they're both key lights. However, you can make product photography work with just one light. So the next few lights that we're gonna talk about aren't mandatory, but they do add a couple of details to your photo that again, layer and just add that extra punch to your pictures. The next one is a rim light. I'm gonna link this super good product photographer that I've learned from. He is amazing, I'll link his video down below. His channel is called Bot Vidsen, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but his name is Martin. He is an incredible photographer. Um, definitely check out his videos, but one light that he uses is a pro photo flash with a cone on top. And that's really important because you get a really nice focused light on the rim of your product. It doesn't have as drastic of an effect on board games in particular because of the texture of board games. Like, you know, you have cardboard versus like metal, shinier objects for like techie gear. Bottom line, the rim light gives a nice sheen to the box and an overall light halo to the board game components. And lastly, the third type of light is called the fill light. Now this light source serves to fill in the shadows. You want this light to be the least obvious one. You wanna see all your light sources coming from one direction. If you see lights coming from the top and the bottom and the left and right and they don't blend well, then it looks really bad and instantly separates amateur from pro.
So this fill light that I'm using for now is uh, the Yongno light stick that I talk about all the time, but I set it to be very, very dim so you can barely illuminate the shadows casted by the box. So in summary, here's what the lighting setup looks like by adding in one light at a time. First, your key light. For this setup, I'll put it as a backlight. And then we add in your rim light. And now, the fill light. Okay, so I wanted to break down this scene real quick. We have a lot of things going on. First off, let's focus on the key light on the top with Aperture 120D. So here we have the key light pointing straight at the box. Reason why the honeycomb grid is important is because it provides focused light right on your board game. Notice here how I also have the key light pretty far away. I want to diffuse it even though it has a honeycomb grid on. I still want to keep it somewhat diffused far away from the board game. If you put it too close, that's how you get really bad reflective glares. Now secondly, here I have my rim light, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the setup because if you have very shiny components, the rim light just gives a really nice sheen to those metallic, glowy, very, very shiny surfaces. A board game box is not going to be as obvious, but still it provides a nice little layer of light as you can see right up top of the box. Now the GVM rim light is actually set at the dimmest setting possible. And then we move on to the third light in the very far back. Notice how this one is also pretty far back as well because the Yongno light stick is actually very harsh. So I want to keep it as diffused as possible. So I'm pushing it all the way back. So the purpose of a fill light is to keep it very, very dim and I want to fill in the shadows. So the Yongno light stick actually is set around one out of 100 and it's pushed far back. So I'm very lightly filling in the shadows as you can see here. If you make it too harsh, you're gonna see that background separation in the back and it's gonna look really bad because it is coming from a different angle from the other lights. And the last part of the setup is of course my camera, which you can see the tripod right here. So this is kind of angled downward so you can see a little bit of the top of the box. I'm also angling the box, it's not just a flat surface. Big differences, right? Again, if your options are just one light, you can make it work, but it will look better with the three light sources that we talked about. We'll also discuss how you can adjust all those lights for different components when we get into composition. Composition is definitely going to be one of the videos that I look forward to making the most. Now, next up, let's talk about the backdrop. So the most important thing here that a lot of people miss is the color of the backdrop that you need. Most would automatically go for a white backdrop, right? Wrong. Before I tell you the answer, comment down below what you think is the answer to this very question. This is the best way to learn, trust me. Why would you avoid using a white backdrop for product photography? I'll give you a moment. You figured out, white lights everywhere, white backdrop, and what if your box is white as well? The answer, is that you will lose a ton of information in your photo and you get something like this. It's very difficult to adjust this in post because if you adjust exposure, that's white too. So you wash out all the colors and everything becomes very hazy. So make sure for your backdrop, I would go with a gray or charcoal or a neutral color like that. On top of gray, compensating for the loss of data. And when I say data, I mean like how much information you can edit in your photo before you see noise and color loss, all the things you don't want in a picture. Gray also looks very clean, very sleek, and very upscaled as well. Now this roll of paper that I'm using is sitting on a backdrop set and it's very affordable. You don't need anything fancy for that. I like to have this set up high so that way when I'm filming now, it's out of frame and you can easily just bring it back down when you're ready to take pictures. On top of that, this stand is a great makeshift studio that I'll make a whole separate video on as well. But they even come with clips for you to attach to your table. So just be aware that this stand is pretty flimsy though, just in case you have kids and pets. Hopefully you can put it and stage it somewhere that is pretty isolated. Now moving on to three other things that I use that are way more niche, unique, weird, whatever you want to call it. However, they are essential for producing some uh, pretty cool pictures. So first I have this black wire. I find wire is a lot better than fishing line which I also have here as well. Fishing line is great if you want to make your photoshopping life much easier. However, I like to use wire because you're able to bend them and just manipulate them in any kind of shape you like, right? So I use wires in every shoot and this is one way that you can make your pictures stand out. This is how you make levitating items and it also makes whatever you're shooting much more interesting instead of just laying out all your components on a table and make it all flat. The second item or items that I use are acrylic panels. So this acts as a reflective surface for your products. They come in a set actually in both black 
and white or whatever one you like to use. So if you're trying to highlight very fine details or if you like the look of a more mirrored surface, then these are a great option. Again, they are linked down below. The ones I linked down below are for smaller components. So if you want to photograph bigger items, definitely get a bigger size. And you should also know that these sides both have a plastic wrap. So once you kind of, you know, scratch up one surface enough, then you can kind of just go and flip it over to the other side. It has a pretty short shelf life, I would say, because even if they collect dust on one side and you're wiping it off, you're gonna end up scratching it somehow and leave residue regardless of whatever type of cleaner that you use. I haven't found a cleaner that works really well with this. So yeah, just be wary that the longer you have this, then the more it's going to, uh, the more work it's gonna give you in Photoshop as well. And thirdly, probably the strangest thing that I use, and that is a copy of Santorini. But more specifically, the medium-sized buildings from Santorini. Now, nothing against the game, of course, but in the game, you get these mini buildings, and I carry a bag of these whenever I go on to a shoot because they have proven to be amazing card stands. The middle-sized buildings are flat, and they also fit the shape of cards, and you can also stack them as well in case the cards are too tall. So I use these all the time to prop up cards, to prop up player boards, and so on. They're also all the same size and shape, so the way you prop it up also remains pretty consistent as well. However, if you have better options than these to prop up cards, let me know. But I have found these to be pretty amazing so far for product photography. And that concludes all of the gear that I use for product photography. If you have any questions about anything that I use or any of the items that we talked about today, go ahead and let me know down in the comments below and I will see you all in episode three. Who would have known these buildings would have served such a amazing purpose for product photography? The things you find to make photography work.